Hi, this is Mr. Conti, and uh, what I'd like to do with this video is to help you guys review over topics that will be covered on your upcoming exam three, which covers chapters eight through eleven. So I have a list of topics that I want to discuss with you as review, the first of which are air masses. These letters are abbreviations for different properties of air masses. They are not air masses themselves because when we describe an air mass, the properties that we look at are temperature and moisture. And so C here stands for continental which indicates a dry air mass. M stands for maritime, which is a moist air mass. So these are our temperature contrasts. Capital T stands for tropical, which is a hot air mass. And P stands for polar, which is a cold air mass. There is an additional letter, which is capital A. This is the Arctic. And that stands for very cold. So by themselves, these letters do not represent an air mass. They are one of two properties that you must combine together to give a more full description of that air mass. So you must combine a temperature property with a moisture property. So we can create one example is a CP air mass that's continental polar. So this is a dry cold air mass we could do a CT air mass and that is a continental tropical air mass that's dry and hot. We can skip down to maritime now and combine maritime with tropical and so that is a wet and hot air mass. You can do a maritime polar which is a wet cold air mass. And the fifth one that is that comes up in the winter is if you have an air mass that's coming from the Arctic that's very cold, the Arctic is a tundra like environment which means it's a cold desert. So you're not going to have maritime uh, air masses coming from the Arctic. So the only one we have to worry about is a continental Arctic, which is a very cold, dry air mass. So these are the five air masses that will uh, appear on, on the exam. Uh, what the colder the air mass, uh, so the continental polar, the maritime polar, and the continental arctic. These three cold air masses are much denser and heavier than the tropical air masses. So cold uh, is denser than hot. That's a rule of thumb to remember. Here's a map of where the air masses originate from. So all of the air mass types that I wrote on the last page are listed here. The maritime air masses originate over water. So your M's 
in the Pacific. Both of these are maritime air masses. Maritime in the Gulf, maritime in the Atlantic. All your continental air masses originate over the land. Continental over in Mexico and the southern states. Continental from Canada and continental from northern Canada and Greenland. All your polars are up here by the Canadian border, whereas Arctic is coming from deeper into northern Canada by the North Pole. All the tropical air masses uh, stem from the tropics down here. So as long as you know what these symbols represent, you should be able to fill in a diagram like this one to describe where these individual air masses originate. The next topic on the list here are fronts. So fronts are boundaries between the air masses. So where they the two air masses meet, you get a frontal boundary. There are four different types of fronts. The cold front is the separation of cold air um, in the north and warm air in the south. So as a cold front comes into through the area, it brings in cold air. So cold front brings in cold air. And it's designated with these triangles, these little saw teeth, and, and uh, colored in blue. The warm front brings in warm air. So when a warm front passes through the area, it brings in warm air. It's designated in red with these semicircles. The stationary front has the alternating red and blue symbols. And it is where cold and warm air flow parallel to each other. So because of some of the rotational patterns established above the stationary front, you will have cold air. And below it, you would have warm air. The occluded front combines the semicircle and triangle symbols that we see in the other two fronts. But they're all on the same side. It's purple. And where these occur is when the cold front overtakes the warm front. Because in general, the cold front moves faster than the warm front. In this picture, what we're seeing is when a cold front passes through, that it almost acts like a plow, which pushes the pre-existing warm air out of the way and drives it upward. And so that warm, moist air, which was settled in place previous to the cold front, is now forced upward into colder environments where it reaches saturation and, becomes, and begins to condense to form clouds and precipitation. So it's a very abrupt uplift because the cold front is a dense brings with it a dense air mass. Cold is denser than warm. So it's the cold air builds up below the warm air. It drives the warm air up. And that causes the condensation to form up in the atmosphere. What you see here with the clouds, remember that in the upper upper level, upper levels of the troposphere, the winds are much stronger. So the clouds that are billowing up in this cumulonimbus cloud are then carried by fast motion winds aloft ahead of the front. So you can see when this front is coming because all of the clouds that have been built up uh, reach the top of the troposphere where the jet stream is and is carried much faster 
than the actual front itself and so you can look for the high clouds as an indicator of a cold front coming through. Also look for the change in wind direction. In general the winds come ahead of the front come from somewhere warmer so the south, southwest that's the direction that they're coming from and then they'll ch turn um, usually go from southerly to westerly so at first it'll be westerly and then as the storm system continues to move through uh, you might get more of a northwesterly flow as more of the cold end builds in place with the warm front uh, the warm air tries to take over the cold air but because it's less dense it has a hard time moving the cold air out of the way so what it does is it leaves the cold air in place for quite a bit and continues to to push upward into the atmosphere so as a warm front approaches you'll see the cloud deck uh, lowering so you'll see these high cirrus clouds cirrus stratus and then we get into the uh, middle layer with the alto stratus and by this point now we've put enough moisture because this is a maritime tropical air mass typically and so it is bringing up with it a lot of moisture and so it's reaching the cold areas of the atmosphere and condensing out and so in the winter time then you also then have to pay attention if it's the moisture is coming into areas of colder air then as it falls through where it's colder below freezing it's all snow sleet where it's cold aloft but it's warm uh, where the warm air is built in so it melts but then at the surface it's closer to 32 so it refreezes but where we have temperatures above 32 then the it's always rain all the way down now that the air is fully saturated uh, the radiation fog will continue even as the warm front itself passes through here we can see the occlusion sequence. So as a mid-latitude cyclone develops and matures, uh, what is notable is that the area of circulation is this low pressure center here. So because of the Coriolis force the and the pressure gradient force, air is rushing towards the low but is forced to diverge to turn in a counterclockwise fashion in the northern hemisphere. So all our mid-latitude cyclones in the northern hemisphere have air rushing towards it, towards the low pressure center on the surface, but around the low pressure in a counterclockwise fashion. So that at the surface that is converging air, which I'll go over again momentarily. But what that does, that circulation, that counterclockwise rotation, splits the air masses up. Originally, it was just cold air to the north and warm air in the south. But as we get this circulation, the cold front moves faster than the warm front. So, and this whole storm, generally, will move to, towards the east or northeast. So that is generally the direction of motion of these storms depending on the prevailing wind patterns available. The low pressure will move from west to east or from southwest to northeast. If you are at let's say location B, as the warm front approaches the pressure is going down. As the low comes towards you, the pressure will start to decrease. You are still in an area of colder air. As the warm front passes, the wind directions change. You're now 
you're into a different air mass which is much which is more humid and warmer so we'd be looking for um, some storms developing along the front as the air masses mix the pressure will continue to drop as the low continues to to move towards the east and then the next front you're expecting then is the cold front which will once again change the wind direction it'll bring in some more moisture as the you have advection the cold advection cold air mixing in with warm air and the wind directions will shift and then as the cold front passes that means this is marking the end of the system in your area and you would see that the pressures would begin to rise once the cold front passes the pressures begin to rise and so high pressure may build in once the cold front passes through and you're left with uh, clearer skies and much more drier uh, conditions but if we watch this storm mature because the cold front is moving faster you would see that the occlusion begins to take place so occlusion marks the mature stage of a mid-latitude cyclone full maturity full occlusion you can see almost like a zipper we've combined it, the warm front and the cold front into a solid occluded front and that will usually mark the mature stage of a mid-latitude cyclone the next topic is the difference between convergence and divergence converging air versus diverging air the difference that we have discussed in class has to do with where the air converges and diverges so you're always going to compare what is happening at the surface and what is happening aloft remember that convergence means that the air masses the winds direct are directed towards one another so convergence means that the air comes together divergence means that the air splits apart and moves away from each other convergence on the surface happens around low pressure centers so on the surface when you have a low pressure air will typically move towards the low if you have a surface high pressure air will diverge and move away from the high this is a surface view this is um, looking at it like a street view if we were to look at this top down around the low pressure as the air in the northern hemisphere rushes in towards the low it is forced to diverge it is forced to to deviate from its straight line path towards the low and is deflected to the right and so if you build up a bunch of these arrows you eventually come to a picture of a counterclockwise rotation that happens right around the low and so with that rotation if there was a stationary front that had settled in here then what ends up happening is as the as the warm air tries to creep into colder areas a clear warm front develops 
and as the cooler air tries to come in where warmer air was, then we get a clear cold front to develop. And so it's always in this pattern that we get these two fronts. Notice again if you follow the counterclockwise pattern you can draw in some station models that show that the winds here would be coming in from the south or southwest. If you go counterclockwise around and you go behind the cold front to get to this point you would have had to come from this direction You can do some other samples. So here we're trying to go towards the low. So those are a couple of sample wind directions around this low pressure system. Around the high, air is being is flowing outward. And so around the high pressure, as it deviates to the right of its path, it's forced to go in a clockwise rotation. But air will converge and diverge aloft as well. So knowing how the upper air convergence or divergence occurs in relation to what's happening at the surface will ultimately determine whether or not a storm intensifies or weakens. The rule is if you have low on top of low that is not a favorable condition for a storm to intensify. The reason is is that you just have basically the air piling up rather than lifting. So if the air was lifting then what that would say about the air aloft is that there should be higher pressure because you're pushing more air into a region that generally has lower pressure. So as if, if you have a column of air that's rising up then aloft you should see higher pressure. But for whatever reason there's no lifting and so the pressure stays low aloft and will remain low on the surface. So you would want wherever this wherever there is a low pressure aloft you want that to be offset from the low pressure at the surface. This model favors intensification the low pressure aloft is not directly over the low pressure at the surface. What you get here is an upper level trough, which is the bottom of this wave. To the right of the trough, we say that that air is diverging. That's because on the surface, if a low pressure has developed in this bottom right quadrant, the, the southeast portion of this low, upper level low, then what that means is the air is going to rise. When it hits this flow, it's immediately taken out like a conveyor belt and placed in this river that pulls the air away from the low if the divergence aloft is greater than the convergence at the surface the storm will intensify. So if we're pulling more air out of this column than air being rushed into the column then the tendency is for the air to rush more at the surface. So if it continues to, to rush more inward, the winds get faster, the circulation gets stronger, the uplift becomes more turbulent, 
and the storm intensifies. So if the divergence aloft is greater than the convergence at the surface, the storm will intensify. To the left of the trough, you have converging air aloft, and so that'll help to build in greater high pressure because at the surface, air is diverging away. And in this conveyor, part of the conveyor, we're pouring in air into this column, which is essentially missing air. When the air diverges at the surface, it's creating a deficiency aloft. But with this river of air flowing, you constantly get a, f a supply of air from aloft. So you want this uh, situation where the low, surface low that has developed is to the southeast quadrant of the upper level low. That is the best place for that low to be to intensify into a more dramatic storm. Ultimately, the jet stream tells the storm where to go. It is, it is feeding off of the, the fact that where there's divergence aloft, um, air is rushing out of this column. And so it tries to keep up with wherever that air is rushing out. So it tends to stay below the area of divergence. So in general, as the, um, the jet stream bends in various ways and the, cr and the trough changes its position, that'll help to steer the storm into different areas. The surface prevailing winds generally take our storms here west to east or from like in this case southwest to northeast that is typical for the direction the paths that our storms will take the life cycle of a mid-latitude cyclone is referred to as cyclogenesis and so the process through which a mid-latitude cyclone develops, intensifies, dissipates, uh, is, is uh, we favor what we call the Norwegian polar front theory, that all mid-latitude cyclones form along what we call a polar front in our area in the mid-latitudes. And there's a kink that happens within the front so we start off with our stationary front, and then as the kink occurs, uh, maybe based on the topographical features, the mixing of the air masses begins. And as long as the you have the right conditions aloft, as we just described, then uh, the storm can continue to intensify. So this stationary front here is what we would refer to as the polar front. You have the cold air that, that stays near the poles. That's where it could be coming down into, into Canada and, and in the winter comes down into the United States. But it's that cold air that originally formed in the Arctic that is pushing its way down because of the jet stream. The warm air from the tropics south south of that but when you have the stationary front these two air masses flow parallel to each other in opposite directions but as the cyclone develops the kink happens within the polar front and it starts to move the warm air into regions that were once cooler cold air into regions where it was once warmer. Advection starts. This is warm advection when warm air crosses into cold air. Cold advection where cold air passes into warm air. But once that rotation starts, the low will develop. The mixing air 
causes saturation aloft and condensation and, uh, occurs, so storms form. If the upper level conditions are right, the storm continues to intensify and the storm begins to reach maturity as occlusion begins. Here we have full occlusion. And here's an example of a typical mid-latitude cyclone. If we look at this picture, a couple things that we can notice is this is the this is the surface map. This is the upper air map, typically the a 500 millibar map is the best to see the jet stream and this is a radar image that shows the moisture content in the in the atmosphere if we look at the surface map you can see the isobars that concentrically move away from the low so the lowest pressure is going to be found right at the center where the low the L is labeled and no matter which way you walk you generally are moving towards areas of higher pressure. Around the low, we have counterclockwise rotation. Where the isobars are closest together, you have greater wind speeds. So around the low, uh, it should be very windy. All this area in green is our areas of moisture, and so it is common to see that around the fronts. Around the high pressure, we expect clear skies. So the isobars to the southwest are spaced out further apart, so the winds would probably be generally calm. The uh, just northeast of the high pressure isobars are a little bit closer together so the winds will be a little stronger but still um, should be cloud free and uh, during the day it would be sunny skies so it's pleasant weather associated with those high pressure regions but where a low comes through the area it's going to bring with it all the rain but what this image shows you is where the upper level trough is so the low pressure aloft is centered here sort of buried in this dip within the upper level jet stream so the low is essentially in that southeast quadrant of the upper level trough so it is in the area of of diverging air. Because the air aloft is rushing away from the low. But eventually if the jet stream moves these two might overlap the upper air low and the surface low and when they overlap that will cause the storm to diminish. Under the topic of forecasting, you should be able to use your knowledge of mid-latitude cyclones, their motion, the, the types of weather you get in low and high pressure zones around warm and cold fronts to make a prediction if you know, in general, a storm moves in the same path that it moved six hours previous. So you could be given an image where you have a storm that has moved and you'll see what it looked like six hours ago and what it looks like now. And so that allows you to anticipate the track. And you'll have some cities around the storm and so you should be able to, based on that picture, identify if the trend were to continue what those cities would likely see.
So that's that's uh, generally what I expect for forecasting. Obviously, uh, taking a scientific meteorology course geared towards science majors. Uh, there's a lot of technical things that a meteorologist has to learn about computer programming, modeling, uh, and all the uh, physics and math that goes into making those programs that uh, we didn't cover too much about. Ultimately, we said that many forecasts go wrong because the computer models are flawed, that they only take into account uh, local features, but not small enough that they catch everything, and that uh, ultimately there are certain things that just don't go, are not even considered that do make an impact, however small, uh, some of that's, that information can ultimately uh, play a, a big role over time. So if you have a bunch of different forecast models, a lot of times meteorologists will run them all together as ensembles and form an ensemble forecast. Uh, the way that they're represented are uh, using by using spaghetti plots. So this is tracking the snowfall totals for a storm in Boston and it's clear that given the amount of time that you allow to pass in this model that there's a lot of divergence in the agreement or the, the skill within the, the model so all of these, if, if you let the models run, they each predict different outcomes for the snowfall totals. So there are, must be other factors that meteorologists look at to get a better idea of what will actually happen because it seems as though if we start at 7 p.m., that if we wait 24 hours, at this point, there's already quite a bit of variation. Within 12 hours, it's not so bad. So 12 hours, we have a pretty good idea of the type, the amount of snowfall that we can expect once the storm starts to move in. So at 7 p.m., there has, there, there's no snow yet. And it looks like after 1 p.m. is when the snow starts. And we get a pretty good sense that the rate at which we're picking up snow by 12 hours into that forecast is pretty accurate. But 24 hours, there's already a lot of uh, differences in the, in the way the models project that um, what will happen. And certainly, if we wait till 7 p.m. the following day, that's 48 hours, uh, we have one model that is predicting 51 inches of snow and one only predicting three and a half. So the way statistics works is that um, the average is statistically more likely. So the mean snowfall total is 24. And so all of these models center around the mean and so it's likely, it's most likely that it'll be closer to 24 than these extremes. But this wouldn't be the only thing that a meteorologist would use to forecast this particular storm. They would look at other factors. And that's what these other techniques are. So they look for trends. Is there something that the storm was doing that maybe the computer models don't pick up that a person can look at maybe a radar image or a satellite image and see that over the last six hours it was doing something that if um, if, it were, there, if there's reason to believe that it would continue that would lead to a more specific result. Is there anything 
similar that we've seen in the past that looks like this storm. That's where we take an analog or statistical forecast. So we look for something that behaves or looks like what we're dealing with now from the past. And the large scale structures of the forecast can be, you can look at from um, climate and long term types of um, predictions. So ultimately, chaos is a factor that creeps into every forecast. Within the first few hours of the forecast, no problem. Short range forecasts uh, are end up being anywhere from six hours to a few days. So that might be your weekend forecast going into your uh, five day forecast. The medium range can get you through next week. So seven days is roughly the uh, the best reasonable forecast that any meteorologist can make. When we look at the surface level maps in class, when we can see certain features here on, on the east coast that are happening on the west coast and that with persistent analogs we can look and say, okay, the storm is moving from west to east, so given the rate that it's moving, it should be here in roughly four days. And so now you have your weather planned out for the next four days. You don't need any computer models for that. You just need to, to make some observations. So you can probably get out to around seven days before um, the, the forecast becomes so far off that um, you know it's there's not really any use in in uh, in in talking about it. So a lot of news stations make uh, advertise ten day forecasts, but I would try to check once you see a ten day forecast. Write down what they say that tenth day is going to be like and many times you will see that as that day approaches the forecast has changed so it's a nice little exercise the uh, experiment to try out so if we take a look at this map here you're seeing the the change the development of this storm and the the path that the low pressure is taking is the uh, typical Nor, uh, southwest to northeast track and this is over from here to here is a 12 hour period from here to here is a 24 hour period so we can see that in Memphis Tuesday morning it's still warm it's still a, it's ahead of the warm front so what that means is the air mass that it occupies is still a bit cooler. So it's generally air coming in from the east. And um, the, but once, so give it until Tuesday night and that warm front will have passed. Once the warm front has passed, we can see what that would mean by looking at what looks like the uh, warm front right now is, is behind it looks pretty dry. So we can expect that in Memphis once that warm front passes the air will be flowing out of the south and so it'll get much warmer and the conditions will dry out. If we wait so this is so we have occlusion happening here so here we have the Tuesday at 6 p.m. and the cold front is is located here so once the 24 hours goes by then the now you almost have a full occlusion out through here 
So you'll still have some warm air in Georgia, but behind it you have cold air, and so Memphis is now in the cold air mass, the maritime polar, continental polar, excuse me. So the continental polar air mass, it's going to be dry because this cold front here is this cold front here 24 hours later. So you look at what is going on now, and then as you project it into the future, whatever the conditions are ahead or behind a front is what is going to likely be the situation when it reaches its new position. Thunderstorms are originate from mid-latitude cyclones, but they intensify to produce some severe types of weather. So the general stages for a thunderstorm are the cumulus stage, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage. So you usually have unstable air where it's warmer at the surface, colder aloft, and that helps to get all that warm air to rise. And that's a cooling process, so for the air that's rising, and that heat energy moves into its environment, and that causes the energy, uh, the intensity for these thunderstorms. So in one cumulus cloud that builds up into a cumulonimbus, that's a single cell thunderstorm. They, along fronts, can gather and become multicellular. Supercells, specifically, are the ones that produce even greater severe weather, like hail and um, possibly tornadoes. So here we have a picture of a supercell, where you have the a very large cumulonimbus cloud with its anvil here and where you have the overshooting top that passes it through the tropopause into the stratosphere that is usually because of some some very strong updrafts in the cloud and in this example they're showing that there is a funnel cloud which remember funnel cloud is what we call this type of rotation before it hits the ground and when it makes contact with the surface we then call that a tornado. The most common places to find uh, thunderstorms are in the Florida Panhandle. That has to do with the sea breeze during the day on both sides that leads to lots of convection and the converging air masses that push the warm two maritime tropical air masses they have the same density so they don't know no one air mass gets subducted or ejected upward they both get pushed upward so it, it helps to spawn um, just air mass thunderstorms very quickly throughout the day as the heating progresses and you have that onshore winds so that's that's the frequency of thunderstorms is greatest uh, in Florida but we're talking the intensity of the storms that you're gonna find in the central plains so the most intense thunderstorms are gonna be found where you get the low pressures forming here just over the Rockies and as as the as they come dipping down here because of the jet stream you're gonna get a situation where that cold front is almost running straight north to south and that's where you have the cooler air moving almost straight from west to east and the warm air moving almost south to north that creates types of circulations that not only will cause severe thunderstorms but also um, possibly tornadoes so that's why tornado alley is located here in the 
central plains because that's where you would also find the most severe thunderstorms. Remember when we talked about uh, hail as a form of precipitation that you commonly see in supercell thunderstorms, the way we can measure the intensity of that storm is by taking one of those hailstones and cutting it open to unveil a a onion-like structure. So you'll see these concentric circles and what that indicates is the number of times that hailstone has been whipped around in the cloud. Every time it falls down towards the base of the cloud, uh, more moisture collects onto the stone, the ice ball, and then as it rises back up, that extra moisture has now frozen and when it comes back around it will accrete another layer and then it'll come back around again and pick up another layer and freeze and that process will continue until the updrafts are no longer strong enough to support it and gravity takes over and the hail falls from the cloud. Another common phenomenon in thunderstorms are lightning strikes and the and thunder. So we talked about how in class these two events happen simultaneously. They're born out of the same um, incident. So the lightning is due to a discharge of built up electrical charges within the cloud. So as the, the turbulent, turbulent air moves around within the cloud, you get uh, ice crystals that rub against each other which throw off extra charges into the cloud. The, the cloud separates the charges generally negative charges at the base of the cloud, positive charges at the, the, the top of the cloud. And through a process called induction, the negative charges pull on, that are at the base of the cloud, pull on positive charges that are at the surface. And when they pull hard enough to join together, then a path for those charges to move is created and you see that in a release of energy where as the charges rush to the ground they heat the air to such a high temperature that it's a few times hotter than the surface of the sun for a moment so you can tell that by the color of the lightning so the sun is generally a yellow white color and that's because it's burning uh, at its surface at around 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If lightning looks whiter or bluer, then you know that that temperature is hotter than the the sun. You can also have green lightning too. That's that is also hotter than uh, that's around the same temperature as white lightning. But if it's a if it's a blue bol um, bolt of lightning, if it has bluish hues in it, you know that it's probably two or three times the temperature of the surface of the sun. And what that does is that heat energy uh, uh, creates a pressure that pushes out um, onto the air around it and basically forms a clap that sends a shock wave throughout the, the atmosphere. And so that's what we hear as thunder. So if you were standing right by a place where lightning has struck, then you would hear the thunder very loud and almost simultaneously. But the further away you are from where the lightning actually struck, the longer it's going to take for you to hear the thunder. They won't happen simultaneously because light travels much faster than sound. 
So you will almost see the lightning the instant that it happens because it travels so fast. I mean, the light can light can travel to the moon and back in two seconds. So if lightning's happening uh, only a few miles from your line of sight, then you're going to see that almost instantaneously, fractions of, of, a, of a second it will take to arrive to your eye. But sound travels slower. It still travels fast, but it travels slower than light. So there's a delay. And we talked about how to do some basic calculations with knowing that delay. So the rule of thumb is for every mile that a lightning bolt is away from you, it will take five additional seconds for you to hear the thunder. So if the lightning strikes a mile away, and it could be a mile on the surface, or it could be a mile in the air, because there could be cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, then if it's a mile away, you'll hear the thunder happen about five seconds later. If it's two miles away, then it's 10 seconds later. Three miles away, 15 seconds later. Four miles away, 20 seconds later. The farther the lightning is, uh, the there are other chances for why you might not hear it. Uh, there's obstacles that could reflect the sound and cause you to be in a position where the sound is moving away from you rather than towards you. As you can see in this picture, and even though these sound waves are very energetic, they, they're pushing the air very, very strongly, the, the intensity of that sound diminishes over time because of the action that it has on the, the, the molecules in the air. So if you're standing right up against the bolt, it would be very loud. The farther you are away, the sound will become um, less intense. We also talked about how everywhere along the lightning, you're creating that sound wave. And so because you might be standing in a position where the sound waves are coming from different heights, that's why you don't hear a single clap and rather a rumble because you're, you're listening as each leading edge of, of these sound waves hit your ear at different times. So that gives us the impression, the, the, um, we interpret that as the, the, the rumble of the thunder. Tornadoes are part of those supercell thunderstorms. When we looked at the where you could find the strongest thunderstorms, the most severe thunderstorms, we looked at the central plains. And it wouldn't come to a surprise then to see that that is also where you're going to find the, uh, the greatest number of tornadoes. We call this Tornado Alley. In the Central Plains, that is typically where you will find those. Tornado season is anywhere between April and July. April and June, that's uh, uh, those, it peaks in May, but it is the uh, mid to late spring, early summer, where you have the polar front retreating back up into Canada, and the conditions become right for the, the, the cold fronts that produce these types of storms occur in the central plains. But somewhere between April and June are the, is the, uh, the, the peak of tornado season in the Midwest. If you want to look for a tornado, you're going to be looking for on a radar image for this hook-shaped echo. That 
that hook here that you see in this depiction is an indicator of the rotation that would um, coincide with the formation of a tornado. The way we distinguish between tornado watches and warnings typically have to do with whether the conditions are favorable for tornadoes to form then they can issue a watch but you will not receive a warning unless there is some key feature like the hook echo on the radar that would alert a meteorologist to, to issue that warning or that there has been observations made that a tornado has actually touched down so the warnings are reserved for uh, imminent danger we use the Fujita scale to rank a tornado and it's usually based off of the damage that the tornado can do so it ultimately wins but there are different conditions that uh, essentially after the fact weather researchers go in and make measurements and classify the tornado after the fact. And lastly the last topic on this review that we covered were hurricanes which in general can um, do much more damage than tornadoes because they can withstand the same types of winds but the system itself is much larger than any tornado that we've ever seen so the hurricanes can be as large as states uh, and so they can cause significant amount of damage and where they stay form is also much different so what you need to form a hurricane are the tropical waters so in the tropics, these are tropical types of storms. You need light winds, so you can get that initial convection to start and putting that warm, moist air into the, into the atmosphere. You need that moisture, so that high humidity. Warm surface temperatures on the water. That's where all the, 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 the latent heat is that uh, allows for the storm to intensify and that is ultimately the heat engine, the trigger that um, keeps the storm going. And you need something for the surface air to converge. So a kink in that chain again and we can see that off the coast of Africa is where that often occurs. That, that gets the, the kink in motion and as you start to rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere uh, air will continue to converge in towards the center general structure of the hurricane is at the very center we have the eye which is the area of lowest pressure but also the air of uh, the area where the winds have diminished so there's clear skies in the eye so people always talk about the eye of the storm hurricanes are generally the types of storms that have an eye mid-latitude cyclones don't normally have an eye you need more intense rotation to form an eye like that and a larger structure as well but the most severe, it's misleading, that a lot of people use that, the eye of the storm, it's the calm portion within the storm, because the most intense parts of the storm are, hap are happening right outside the, the eye, which we call the eye wall. So that's where you have the greatest winds and the greatest damaging um, uh, f f uh, precipitation that will fall all happens around the eye wall. There are strong bands as well around the center of the storm.
So each one of these bands, they get weaker as you go out. They're most intense around the, the eye wall and generally get weaker as you go out, but they can still pack a punch. So to uh, make the storm end, it needs to be deprived of its energy source. So you either want to pass it over colder water or on onto land where it's robbed of that warm moist water where it generally gets its energy from the stages of a hurricane's development and the categories of a hurricane are dependent on winds so we start off with a tropical disturbance that develops into a depression where you can have winds up to 39 miles an hour which can can happen in some in different mid-latitude cyclones. The tropical storms have winds that go from 40 to 73 miles an hour and once what distinguishes between a tropical storm and a hurricane is this crossover and it's just a definition a, a, a very strong tropical storm can do just as much damage as a weak hurricane so what, what officially gives a storm the title hurricane is when its surf when its winds exceed 74 miles an hour once it becomes a category one then category two three four and five uh, are designated depending on these wind ranges remember that the relative motion of the hurricane combines with the wind speed and leads to the maximum winds to be so, sort of in the the eastern quadrant or the northeastern quadrant of the of the hurricane so if you're straight north or south of the eye obviously the eye wall is still where the most damaging winds are here 75 knots that would that would be the wind speeds there but if you're on the east side moving the east northeast you're combining both the winds of the hurricane itself with the motion of the hurricane and so you in that in that region would experience winds that combine those two velocities together to form the greatest wind speeds so a hundred a hundred knots this 75 is is less because it is against the motion so it's a hundred knots is the the wind speeds the highest wind speeds in the hurricane given that it, if it was stationary but because it's moving on the east side where the winds are rotating in the direction of motion you add the two velocities together and on the opposite side where it's moving and where the winds are rotating in the opposite direction you um, decrease the motion so uh, you have to watch out for this type of rotation as it approaches land because then you're going to have that storm surge and the greatest storm surge is going to be if this if this arrow is pointing this way still in the northeast quadrant because counterclockwise rotation would push the ocean in that northeast quadrant into onto land um, and so not only are you hit with the winds and the torrential downpours but then you're also encountering uh, severe uh, onshore uh, piling up of the, of the ocean which we call storm surge remember that the way we name hurricanes now is by alphabetically alternating female and male names so I showed you guys the list of upcoming storm names hurricane names typhoons cyclones those are just names of hurricanes given in um, that are moving in other oceans but they are still hurricane-like storms that are also given names.
we retire the names if they've caused a significant amount of damage or fatalities. But ultimately, uh, climate forecasts predict that these types of storms will grow in severity. They will become more frequent over time and they will get stronger because of uh, climate change predicting that um, the atmosphere will continue to warm and provide and uh, provide the suitable ingredients that lead to these types of storms. One little um, piece of information I'll leave you with uh, that I failed to mention in class, which is actually pretty interesting. Uh, you know, my area of focus is mostly in, in astronomy and astrophysics, so I uh, enjoy talking about the planets. And this is the largest planet in the solar system. This is the planet Jupiter. I showed you pictures of Jupiter before because I wanted to show you the cloud bands. So where we have all those different wind belts, the polar easterly, the westerlies, the trade winds, we have three belts in the northern hemisphere, three belts in the south. You can see that wherever these colors and the swirls really alternate, those are different wind belts on Jupiter. And that's because the rotation, it's much larger than the Earth. And uh, the and the rotation is much faster than the Earth. So the Coriolis force is stronger. So these, uh, there's n the deflection is much more apparent. So these these winds race back and forth um, over time. But this red spot here is a hurricane. So for all intents and purposes, we call this thing a hurricane. It is from here to here about two and a half times the size of the Earth. Galileo, in his notes, drew a picture of Jupiter with this hurricane. So it has been raging on Jupiter since the early 1600s at least, and has continued since our modern day observations. NASA has released a, an article about um, possibly seeing it diminish in size over the last couple of decades. But nevertheless, it's still a huge storm that would engulf the Earth more than twice over. And it's driven by the same types of processes that we would understand here. The thing is that Jupiter is a gas giant and has no surface that we can, that we would think of like here on Earth that you could land a ship on. And so it is constantly being supplied by the the warm atmosphere below it of all that intense pressure the the sheer weight of jupiter compresses the gases in internally that uh, that is the energy that it uses and and there's no land to pass on so it just continues it it it's in a good spot where the cer the low pressure continues to drive more gases inward and it just rotates uh, and and circulates around the the uh the atmosphere of Jupiter and uh it's one of the you know one of the key f one of those features in the solar system that uh, a lot of people will uh tend to see if they make these types of observations so uh i hope that this uh, video has provided you with some useful information to help you prepare, and uh, we'll see you in class.